The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Now, yesterday, actually the day before yesterday, there was a very large storm that came through the area. It started in Illinois and pushed through Indiana into Ohio, intensifying all the way. Uh, once it got to Ohio, it hit uh, the metro Columbus area. Over 500,000 people without power in this area. We were spared, that's why I'm talking. And it moved on eastward all the way to the District of Columbia, and it says that D.C. may be dark for days. I think D.C. has been dark for years, but... D.C. dark for days. It was quite a storm and quite an event. They call it the land hurricane. And uh, they were, yesterday on the radio, they were asking people to name the storm. I had my own name for it, but I won't mention what it is. It would be outside of uh, what we need to know in Bible class. So let's look at Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Right here we have the beginning of the church age. Now there's one thing about Acts, Matthew and Acts, and actually Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts that you have to understand. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were written during the dispensation of Israel technically. Now you could say also they were written during the dispensation of the hypostatic union. But the hypostatic union still functioned as if it was under, in other words, our Lord functioned as if he was living in the, age, in the age of Israel. However, he still utilized that unique spiritual life that he's passed down to us. So when we get into Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and 1 Corinthians, it comes very, actually any part of the Bible, it, but especially in these areas, it becomes very important to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. Because in Acts, we'll be dealing with the fact that they are transitioning from the age of Israel, from the age of the hypostatic union, into the pre-canon church age. And the book of Acts mainly deals with... Uh, starting off the age of Israel, then progressing into the pre-canon church age. And a lot of pastors are confused by Acts because they have no idea that the, what, what does it mean to have a pre-canon church age. That means before the Bible was completed. And then uh, they become very confused. And this, from this has been the spinoff in which we've had a lot of organizations such as the Pentecostals. The Pentecostals are acting as if they live in the pre-canon era and yet they don't even follow that. They're just way off into evil. Evil! Anyone who claims they speak in tongues is an evil person. They are involved in wrongdoing. Anyone who claims that they are going to a place where they're having healings, etc., they are evil, off on the wrong track. Why? They failed to rightly divide the word of truth. But in, when you rightly divide the word of truth, Acts is an easy book 
I heard a pastor once who came out of Baraka Church say that Acts was the most difficult book he ever went through. And for him, I believe it, because it takes a lot to rightly divide the word of truth. But you're in luck. It takes a tremendous amount of doctrine to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. And you're in luck, because I know exactly how to rightly divide these things. Acts 2.42 they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And this fellowship has to do with the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit. It actually has to do with, for the first time even, they were operating under the two power options. People had the filling of the Spirit, and along with that they were learning Bible doctrine. So the apostles were teaching, and guess what? Their congregations devoted themselves. That means they listened daily, sometimes for hours and hours and hours. We don't seem to have that appetite today. But in those days, they did have the appetite, and along with that, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. There were uh, legal matters in which Christianity was outlawed. If you were a Christian in those days, you were an outlaw. So many people had to make the choice, do I function as an outlaw as a Christian or not? Of course you do. Man's law is meaningless when it comes to these spiritual matters. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The breaking of bread, of course, has to do with the Eucharist. So there was that ritual that they were continuing to practice as well. And we see a lot of mixing of post-canon and pre-canon activity. One of the pre-canon activities, that is before the Bible was written, is baptism, that is water baptism, ritual baptism. That's no longer extant today, although people do it. It is not recommended. In fact, it is discouraged in 1 Corinthians by the Apostle Paul because we move from pre-canon to post-canon. And in the post-canon era, baptism, it's not prohibited, but it is discouraged, that is water baptism. It becomes a confusion, a point of contention. And I know this because one time working at a machine shop, I was listening to a pastor, and he was all upset because the Catholics just dribble on the water on the head, and the others dunk under the water. So it became a point of contention. We dribble water on head and we dunk all the way and he really went into it. You dunk them under! You dunk them under! And he was really all, all fired up about it. But really, it's a non-issue. You're fighting over something that is pre-canon. And it just shows your ignorance related to rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, this is part of rightly dividing the word of truth. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Well, that's pre-canon. That does not happen today. I can't stand up here and perform any type of wonder or do any type of magician act for you to be stunned and in awe. I can't suddenly start make it. Uh, I can't suddenly just uh, make. Look, I got a lame hip myself. I can't make my own hip unlame. I was reading the other day about Joseph. He had a lame hip too, and I wonder where did I go wrong? Did I do something Joseph did? <laughs> Remember, he got hit in the hip socket, and then he limped the rest of his life. Anyway, every, that's pretty, I'm joking with that stuff. But everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. That's because, look, you don't have a Bible at that time, not a New Testament. You have an Old Testament, but you're moving into a new dispensation, the church age, and you don't have any instructions regarding the church age, none. I, you... Peter could not stand up and say, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. There was not one. Peter could not stand up and uh, refer to John's writing and say, go to 1 John 1.9. There was not one. 
So how do you know who's right? Who's teaching what is correct concerning the upcoming church age? How do you know? The only way to know is to know who has the credit card of all of these flashy signs and wonders. Who had them? Well, Peter and the apostles. They had these gifts given to them for a short amount of time in order to establish them as the writers of the New Testament in order to complete the canon of Scripture. So yes, they performed miracles, but no one can today. I'll tell you something, and this is what I came up with, and I think it pretty much sums it up. The apostles were there to fill a deficiency. There was no post-canon era. There was no Bible. And, and since there was no Word of God... There's, there, you're deficient. Without the New Testament Word of God, you have a deficiency. They were given these flashy gifts to fill a deficiency. And they are inferior, inferior to what we have today. And a lot of people, because people love scintillating type activities. People love to be entertained. And so as a distraction... Satan has very well, in fact, utilized such organizations as those uh, Holy Rollers and the Pentecostals. They go all over the world acting as if they live in the pre-canon era when they do not. We have the canon of Scripture completed. That's why we don't have these flashy gifts. That's why we don't have the gift of tongues. That's why we don't have the gift of healing. All that's gone. But at that time, it was, ex it was in use. Now, what we're going to focus on is in verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. And verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had in need. Now, them having everything in common does not mean that the early church was a communist organization. That is ridiculous and stupid. Everyone had their own money and they gave as to and, and they gave in a way that if someone was in need from grace, grace policy, they would give to those who were in need. And it was very important at this time in history why Christianity outlawed. You can think of this as a legal defense fund. There were some believers who were going to be brought before the court. And in those days, you know, it's really no different than it is today, except then there was even more corruption. You could pay off people. And you could, you could pay off people in terms of give them money to get the believer out of trouble. What did they do wrong? Nothing. They were simply believers in Christ. But it took money to deal with the legal problems, and that's, that never changes throughout all of history. It takes money to deal with legal problems. And so what was this defense fund? For people who had legal problems related to the fact that they were Christians under persecution. And oftentimes believers are best under persecution because, look, they devoted themselves every day to teaching they were sucking in the word of God as fast as they could. Why? They were under persecution. Well, they had a legal defense fund and some of the wealthier believers would give and they would give to the point to where they would have everything in common. If a fellow believer were arrested, the one who had money would go down and bail them out. So what we come to now is the doctrine of giving. So you can understand it. This was not some cult that they started where they said, okay, everybody, everybody who has jobs, take your money, we're going to put it in one big pile, and then uh, we will distribute it evenly among everybody. No, that's not what they did. They had no idea of what uh, a communist-type situation would be. They brought in the money as was needed for those who were in legal trouble or for those who were poor and hungry you can't much learn the word of God if you're starving. So they would feed them. So let's look at giving. 
the doctrine of giving. Giving is an expression of worship to commemorate the grace policy of God. After all, God gave us the greatest gift ever, His uniquely born Son. God loved the world so much that He gave His uniquely born Son so that whosoever believes in Him should never perish but have eternal life. So that's giving. So giving is an expression of worship to commemorate the grace policy of God. God gives us everything. So that's the first principle. Giving is an expression of worship to commemorate the grace policy of God. Giving in the church age is the legitimate function of the believer's royal priesthood in worship. Giving is part of worship. Both inside and outside of the local church. For example, giving is part of the Christian way of life in, in just hospitality toward others. And giving is one of the four categories of Christian service. So principle two. Giving in the church age is the legitimate function of the believer's royal priesthood in worship, both inside and outside the local church, such as in hospitality. You may, in hospitality, give to someone who's in need, and they may not even be inside your local church. So what? Giving is one of the four categories of Christian service. Also, we have Christian service related to your spiritual gift, and that is that some people have a spiritual gift of giving. The spiritual gift of giving runs along very closely with the spiritual gift of helps. And you don't have to be rich to have the spiritual gift of giving. You don't have to be middle class to have the spiritual gift of giving. You can be poor as dirt and have the spiritual gift of giving. You may not be able to give much money, but you give of time. You give, and that goes along with the gift of helps. You give of your time. You give of trying to have sympathy toward one another, etc. Christian, there is... Christian service, therefore, related to your royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. You represent yourself before God. And this includes prayer, giving. Now, now when I say giving and prayer, all of this have to, has to be done in fellowship. I just hope you all understand that right off. All that, if you're out of fellowship, all that's nonsense. It's philanthropy, and you're doing it as we'll find out in Acts chapter 5, with wrong motivation. But you have to be in fellowship and you have to have right motivation. So you have Christian service related to your royal priesthood. And that includes prayer, giving, and of course the execution of the protocol plan of God through learning, thinking, and solving. Your number one objective in the Christian way of life is to execute the protocol plan of God through learning, thinking, and solving. Christian, there's Christian service related to your royal ambassadorship. What's the difference between royal ambassadorship and your royal priesthood? Well, in your royal priesthood, you represent yourself to God. Under royal ambassadorship, you represent Jesus Christ to the world. Under royal ambassadorship, you represent Jesus Christ to the world. All of us are royal ambassadors. All of us are royal priests. All of us who have believed in Christ, that is. Christian service related to your royal ambassadorship. That includes evangelism. That's part of your responsibility. As part of your royal ambassadorship, your responsibility includes evangelism. I have over a hundred CDs on the desk there, up top on the desk, that are ready for distribution for the sake of evangelism. And you can get those and pass them out however you wish. And that is part of Christian service, evangelism, witnessing. You also have the gift of administration in the local church. 
and that is to help the pastor. You see, the, the pastor devotes himself to studying and teaching, and, in, and when you have the gift of administration, that is to make sure everything's in order, that every, for example, nowadays, that everything is working properly on the internet, that we're getting uh, everything uh, done that we need to do in terms of disseminating the word of God that has been taught. Christian, there's Christian service related to the laws of divine establishment. In other words, military service. You are in Christian service when you go into military service. Let me just put it to you this way. If you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, you are in Christian service. But you may express it in different ways. You may be in the military. You may simply be at work at a job. There's Christian service there. As long as you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, you're functioning under Christian service. But I'm just giving you certain categories so that you can understand the actual power of the unique spiritual life. And the fact that there is Christian service related to your royal ambassadorship, you representing Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world and to others, believers as well. There's Christian service related to the laws of divine establishment. That means you can be in Christian service and military service. You could be a police officer in law enforcement. You could actually run for office as a politician and move into government, except you wouldn't really be a politician. You'd be a statesman, but you still have to run and become part of government. There's one thing that's not Christian service, and that is activism. Christian activism is not Christian service. And what is Christian activism? You trying to whitewash the devil's world. There are a lot of things happening right now in this country that I don't like, but you will not see me march down the street and make a big deal of it. We live in the devil's world. Things are going to happen that the devil has set up that we have no power over. The only thing we can do is live our spiritual life. We are on the defense. And we might not like all this socialism that's coming down. Some people do. But we might not like all this socialism. We might say, this is terrible. We're losing our country. You'd be right. But that doesn't give you a right to run up and down the street with placards and signs. That's nothing. That's Christian activism. You're trying to change the devil's world. And the only way that we can save our country is through making sure that we do as they did in Acts. Devote yourself to teaching and fellowship. Devote yourself to the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and learning the Word of God. That's it. That's the only hope for this country. And as the years go by, it gets worse and worse. We're right now under the third cycle of discipline. Very rapidly moving toward the fourth cycle of discipline. It can be turned around if people, believers, decide to make Bible doctrine number one priority. We will see what happens, because I certainly don't know. We can take solace in the fact that Jesus Christ controls history. So Christian service related to your royal ambassadorship is part of it, but never activism. Now giving is the presentation of money or other valuable, let me get back to this, Christian uh, Christian giving is the presentation of money or other valuable commodities which may be used in sustaining the ministry of doctrinal communication. And valuable commodities which aren't necessarily related to money include any type of administration around the church to make the job of the pastor easier so he can simply teach, study and teach, study and teach. That's of great value, and you can't really put money, a money uh, on it. But there's also the giving as a presentation of money, if you have it and you want to give it. And this can be used in the sustaining of the ministry of a doctrinal communication. Now there were times the Apostle Paul had zero money and nobody was given to him, 
but he was turning the world upside down anyway. And that's how I'm going to function. I'm just going to simply teach and let the chips fall where they may. And I don't really care about uh, whether people give money or not. They can if they want to. If they don't want to, they don't have to. It's not, it's not even an issue with me or their help. They can help if they want to or if they drop off and say, I'm not helping anymore. That's up to them, but it doesn't stop me. And that's the attitude of the Apostle Paul. But he does make sure, the Apostle Paul, that everyone understands that they do have responsibilities. Giving is the presentation of money or other value commodities which may be used in the sustaining the ministry of a doctrinal communication. Now these gifts do not pertain to things like building funds or to things, uh, dog and pony shows. All types of money now goes to dog and pony shows in churches and that's to pull the people in. My family and I were joking, my mother, father and me, we were joking the other day about the fact that right now in Columbus, Ohio, there's a lot of people without power. They're hot and they're sweltering. Their homes don't have power. And I said, you know what? We could have the largest congregation tomorrow. All we have to do is say, hey, we have free air conditioning, television, food. We'll have a Bible class and watch a movie afterwards. And then we'll, have, uh, uh, we'll play Parcheesi or something else. And then we'll have a whole bunch of people come over. And I guarantee you we would. It would be the largest congregation you ever saw, but it would be wrong motivation. Now that might be fine for some type of uh, evangelism to get unbelievers in to evangelize, but dog and pony show is not for the church. The church is for believers who are serious toward the word of God. So Christian giving may be extended to other organizations besides your church. You could give to missionary organizations. I have on occasion, when I've had the money, I've given to Moses on Wabiko. He is a missionary. So you don't have to give to your local church. You can give to missionary organizations. You can give to certain Bible schools that are teaching doctrine. You can give to a radio ministry or an MP3 ministry or an internet ministry. Giving is designed to support the communication gifts. That's the point. Giving is designed to support the communication gifts. Missionary, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Giving is the means of inculcating teamwork and coordination into the body of Christ. And once people begin to learn Bible doctrine, they begin to give in ways that are beneficial, and it becomes part of teamwork. When people are giving, now you're not supposed to know who gives what and etc. That's not part of it. And I will never say, okay, we're going to raise money now. Now who gives 50? Almost like an auction. Almost like storage wars on TV. Who gives 50? Now who gives 100? Who gives 1,000? And the person who raises their hand and gives 1,000, well, they're just uh, all glorified. All of that's wrong. And in Acts chapter 5, we will see how that is punishable by death. Under the dying discipline principle, the sin face to face with death, Acts chapter 5, giving money with wrong motivation. I went to one time in upstate New York, I went to a so-called church where they were outside in the nice beautiful air of upstate New York and I was sitting there, I was a teenager and I knew a lot more Bible doctrine than they would ever know at that age and ever did know probably and uh, I sat there and all of a sudden they they got up and they said now who he said first of all he said now the Lord has laid it on my heart that we're gonna get two thousand dollars for this ministry today and he started out that way and then he uh, continued and they started raising money who gives fifty 
Somebody raises their hands. I'm going to give 50. And then somebody else wants to outdo them. I'm going to give 100. I'm going to give 500. And I was so disgusted about it, I about blurted some things out, but my dad stopped me and said, shut up. That's just the way they do things there. It's none of my business. But it was irritating me. Even as a teenager, I knew what they were doing was evil. And then once it got past 2,000, I said, Dad, I thought the Lord laid it on his heart to get 2,000. He's getting more. There's something wrong. No, he went up to 3,000 or something. So I thought the Lord laid it on your heart. And then he said, and then he slipped out of that. He said, well, the Lord is blessed over abundantly or something like that. Well, that's how ridiculous things have gotten. And that's why, and people just don't understand what giving is all about. And again, a principle to write down, giving is the means of inculcating teamwork and coordination into the body of Christ. We are a body, by the way, the body of Christ. And we all have different spiritual gifts. And a lot of times people put all of the emphasis on the pastor teacher. That's why so many power mad people want that gift. If you have any sense, you don't want it really. And I say that uh, risking blasphemy. It's not really true. You, of course, you want if that's the gift you're to have, that's the one you want. I, I don't have a problem with it. But some people, when they realize it, realize the trouble that goes with it because it's a authority type gift. But the gift of pastor teacher isn't the do it all. But that's the way people try to make them. They try to make them do everything. They try to pin on the gift of pastor teacher, the gift of helps. They try to pin on the gift of pastor teacher, the gift of gab. In other words, if I can't, if I don't talk to you after this message and gab with you about your life, then I'm not a really good pastor. That's the idea. But it's wrong. I hate gabbing. You say, well, that's a shock to me. Listen, you teach. Yes, I teach, but I hate gabbing most of the time. I, I just don't. I'm not interested in little frivolous things most of the time. There are times of relaxation and occasion where I can handle it. But that's my own idiosyncrasy. That's my own personality. Very quiet outside the pulpit. Very quiet. Behind the pulpit, God the Holy Spirit grabs me up and away I go. Outside the pulpit, eh, whatever. But sometimes uh, where it's, uh, you know, I'm not a loner, as it were. I like people and hanging around with people and talking with people. I'm just not the extrovert. There's different type personalities. Extrovert, introvert, doesn't matter. I'm more introverted most of the time. It just depends on my mood. But that is outside of what any type of meaning. There's no meaning to that in Christianity. Now we're going to get to the motivation in giving. And that is the big deal. Motivation. You have to be rightly motivated. Motivation. Principle. Motivation is the major issue in giving. Not the amount given. Motivation is the principle in giving, not the amount given. Not at all the amount given. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Motivation is the major issue in giving. Giving. Not the amount given. Well, you could be a multi-billionaire. And you could sit in church and listen and get quite a lot out of it and flop 20 bucks into the giving, you know, when they pass the thing around. Give 20 bucks in there. Yet he's a multi-billionaire and he only gave a 20. But he did it with a smile on his face. And his motivation was, I give this 20 to help this ministry. 
It's his money. He can do with it what he wants, and I don't care if he's a multi-billionaire. If, him, if he feels more comfortable giving a 20, and that's what he wants to give, then that is right motivation, and he does right. He'll be criticized because people will say, oh, he has so much money, and I saw he only gave a 20. He'll be criticized, and the people who criticize will be punished, and they may be punished up into the sin unto death. Because if he gave with right motivation, it doesn't matter how much money God blessed him with. It's his. God blessed him with it. It's his. And since God blessed him with it, it's not only his, it's God's too. See, we have some screwy thinking, which leads to socialism and everything else, which is what we're suffering under in this country. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Corrected translation. Each person, to the degree he has determined by means of his right lobe, so give. Not from distress of mind or compulsion of emotions, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. You'll see cheerful. That means grace-oriented giver. Once again, each person, to the degree he has determined, by means of his right lobe, so give, not from distress of mind or compulsion of emotions. A lot of people can give an emotional type uh, plea for money. And then from emotion, someone gives, and then after they give from their emotional high, they have an emotional low later when they're trying to buy milk at the grocery store, and they realize milk is three bucks when it used to be one dollar, and they don't have it. Each person, to the degree, to the degree he has determined by means of his right lobe, so give. A good way to put it is, when you go into the church, and if you're going to give that day, already have it made up in your mind how much you're going to give. I hate to use this analogy, but sometimes I'll go out gambling. Gambling's not a sin, by the way, unless you deprive your family of food, etc. But every now and then I'll go gamble for fun, for entertainment. And, but when I do, I set in my mind, I have this amount of money. This is what I'm going to gamble with. When I run out, I'm done. And sometimes I'll spend hours and hours and hours, because it's my entertainment. It's my way of getting away from uh, the world for a while and enjoying playing a game. And sometimes I might gamble with that amount of money for 12 hours straight, 16 hours straight. Who cares? Nobody's business. I'm having fun. And as long as I don't lose that money, I can keep gambling with it. And that is what I have determined beforehand. Now, if I lose it, I'm done. So I'm finished now. I'm going to do something else. But most of the time, I just keep playing with it because I'll go up and with the money and then down and then up and then down and then up. But that is what I have determined. And that is what I am comfortable with. And if I lose it all... I don't walk away crying, as I've seen some people do. Cry. Why? They overdid it. They got too emotional. They thought, I'll win all that money back. Not necessarily you won't, and more than likely, no, you're not. That's why they can build those big buildings. Better be careful. And so then people do have gambling problems. You see, gambling's like drinking. Uh, some people can drink and have just a little bit and be fine with it and not go overboard and they are not drunkards yet somebody else uh, who has the gene for it can take a swig and that's it they're they're done for they're done for a while anyway they're gonna be totally drunk and that person shouldn't drink and then there's gamblers who can't gamble because they take that same route. They get emotional about it, and they've got to just blow their whole wad. So the reason why I say drinking is like gambling is because drinking in moderation is not sin, and gambling in moderation is not sin. 
And there are some pastors who've come out of bracket church who say gambling is sin, period, over and out. That's not true. That's not true. People gamble all the time. People gamble on the stock market. People gamble when they buy a car and they want to resell it at a higher price. It's a gamble. You don't know. You may get it. You may not. People gamble when they buy a house. Uh, haven't we just gone through a big housing bust? A lot of people were gambling. and But, you know, that has a higher prestige because you're actually buying something. But guess what? They lost their hide. Now, I've gambled and I've never lost my hide gambling. So you see, it's all about moderation. Same with food. Moderation. Since I'm on a diet... I have to remember, moderation. I forgot it for a while and gained 20 pounds. No moderation. Just ate whatever I want. I saw it in sight. Mm, looks good. Ate it, up, or ate it right up. But you see, you have to have proper motivation, and that's the whole point. And you have to have determined by means of your thinking what to give, not by means of your emotion. When you go into church and you're going to give to the church or to whatever organization, I would say determine beforehand what that's going to be and don't be swayed by emotion. Like at that meeting I went to in upstate New York, emotion was being used about we're going to send out all of these missionaries to the poor people uh, in, in such an area, in such an area. And we are going to grow this area and we're going to do this and you get emotionally fired up about it and then you're giving by emotion. Wrong. Determine beforehand what you're going to give and what you can give and if it's nothing, fine. If you give nothing, you're better off than the person who gave a thousand and weeps about it later. A lot of people do that. And it's a tragedy. They don't understand giving. So once again, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 puts it better than I can. Each person, to the degree he has determined by means of his thinking, so give, not from distress of mind or from the compulsion of emotions, for God loves a grace-oriented giver. You give based on the metabolized doctrine in your soul. You don't give based on your emotions. A lot of people give based on their emotions. You ever see those TV commercials concerning the Africans and they show the little children with their pot bellies because they're malnourished and they say, won't you give just 40 cents a day and you can... Now you may not want to give at first, but then they build you up emotionally. Just 40 cents a day and he'll have a school and he'll be going to school and we'll send you a picture and all this. And, and, and the whole time I always smirk at those because the guy who's uh, giving the commercials wearing a suit and a tie standing beside the, guy, the kid there who has a pot belly and obviously he's wearing a suit and tie and he's well fed and pretty chump, especially that lady one who does it too, pretty chunky and well fed. And I'm thinking, why don't you give him some food? You're right there. I'm way over here. But from emotion... You see this and say, oh, I have got to give. I'm going to tell you something that's sad, but it's true. A lot of those young people in Africa who are starving to death, when they die, they are absent from the body and face to face with the Lord. And if they had lived past the age of accountability, they would never have come to Christ. So that's grace. A lot of what you're seeing in Africa with starvation is grace and it's hard to fathom. And I would probably be, receive a lot of, especially from the liberal do-gooders, a lot of uh, resistance from that. But I don't care. It's a lot better to go to heaven than to have your belly full. Argue with that one. You can't. So motivation is the major key. And you give based upon metabolized doctrine in your soul, not based upon emotions. If you're all emotionally up, charged up, don't give. Don't give it all. God provides and enjoys the mental attitude which accompanies giving. God provides and enjoys the mental attitude which accompanies giving. 
God loves grace-oriented giving. He does not love grudgingly giving. He loves grace-oriented giving. If you're going to grudgingly give, don't give. Don't give it all. If you're going to have a knot in your stomach because you gave away some money, that's terrible. It's terrible for you and it's terrible for the person who receives it. God provides and enjoys the mental attitude which accompanies giving. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 9.8. It's actually just one verse over. 2 Corinthians 9.8. Actually, hold your place there. We will have a break now and come back and resume. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us concerning what we've noted with regard to giving. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.